So yes, yeah, so thank you all for joining me uh, on this panel on the, the digital financial services industry. Um, as you heard, I'm joined by Amit Katina Patel, FBI Super, Supervisory Special Agent, Cynthia Wright, Principal Cybersecurity Strategy from MITRE, Anna Collard from Know Before, and uh, Anup Singh from Microsave. So we have, uh, we've been talking about the problems in the digital financial service industry, in particular in, in perhaps underrepresented areas like uh, Asia and uh, Africa. Um, and to kick us off, I'd like to call on Anna, if I may, uh, to as the, you know, the, the person on the ground to tell us how it differs in her region uh, compared to what we might be, uh, we might be experiencing in you know, Europe and the US. I know you had some very interesting thoughts when we spoke last about how your region is somehow uh, misunderstood, let's say. Oh, well, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Simon. Um, and thanks, Michael. It's a real honor to be here with all of you. Um, so what I shared with Simon before, if we look at Africa, and let's look at it from a macroeconomic point first, our population, the average age here is 19 years old. So we literally have the youngest population in the world and the, the the one that's the most growing. So I actually just yesterday I read that 17 out of the top 20 growing cities are in Africa. And those young people, you know, they they want access to digital means. They they um, have their, their, their mobile phones, they connect to things like um, Netflix and they expect services to just operate like that. Not I'm not I'm not saying you know everyone necessarily because there's such a diverse and it's not just poor and rich. There's a, there's all these different levels of different, um, call them wealth groups or economic groups. But sort of a, a lot of the the youngsters and the people in the urban areas, they are mobile, and they expect um, the same from their financial services providers to be uh, able to do um, you know uh, mobile payments, mobile financial transactions, etc. <clears throat> and in fact, like the sub-Saharan Africa is the area with the most mobile transactions happening globally or worldwide. Um, and I think we do 10% of our, our gross domestic product on mobile transactions. Some of the some of the the, uh, the, the banks, like I spoke to a CISO just the other day in Ghana, they said that the, their mobile transactions exceed or they, they in fact, you know, their USSD, which is like a legacy um, technology that's been used a lot on the feature phone. So the non-smartphone users still use USSD technology. I don't know if any of you remember. Um, it's when you send star, choose like an option and then hash. That's how USSD technology is, is used. And it's still very prevalent on the continent. <clears throat> and the CISO told me that the transactions done by this technology is more so than the traditional other sort of EFT transactions. So mobile is huge, it's growing, and obviously the smartphone adoption um, is also growing. So we will see more and more users moving from feature phones or those sort of, you know, old school um, uh, bricks to more smartphones. Um, a lot of it is also secondhand usage. And that, from a security point of view, comes with a whole host of issues, like what do we do with updates on these phones, patching, and what do we do with mobile malware, which obviously is also a big issue. Um, so those are some of the, the challenges I, th I think that we're faced with on the continent that maybe, you know, in, in Europe or the States, we don't really think about. I mean, the other thing as well as what I said to Simon is that a lot of the users, if we, if we talk about um, the people or the consumers, um, are first-time users. So they haven't grown up with the internet. And it's the first time that they actually get exposed to the internet is via their phones. And they have no awareness uh, when it comes to the threats or the, the impact it could, it could have. So um, digital literacy is huge. Um, and then, you know, there's the obvious, the, all the other infrastructure issues, like a lot of um, the more sort of um, rural areas don't even have access to, to electricity. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, I guess those are sort of my main points. I, I can um, go on about the cybercrime situation, but I think we'll get into that a bit later. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's fascinating. So you have a very young population, digitally, digitally naive, perhaps, a very interesting tech estate. Um, Amit, can I bring you in the conversation? I know you have some, some speciality in this area. I mean, how does cybercrime <clears throat> differ in this region with, regarding the digital financial services? Are there unique attacks or unique strategies or you know, how would you call it? Sure. So 
I think if you would look at the last 10 years um, within the cybersecurity industry, uh, from the Western point of view, you know, as bad as it may look in the headlines, particularly, you know, the first half of this year, what the West is really dealing with is success in the cybersecurity industry. Um, so if you look at the, the, the large hacks um, that have occurred this year, right? So you've got solar winds, you've got the Microsoft Exchange, you know, vulnerability that was widely uh, leveraged, Pulse VPN, Kaseya, um, you know, targeting MSPs to deploy ransomware. These are all sophisticated attacks, right? These are referred to as supply chain attacks. So when I say that it's a success story, we've been able to, you know, basically clamp down, take care of, you know, kind of the, the lowest level in terms of getting access to a network, which would be traditionally the spearfish. Um, and so that's a, that's a success story um, on, the, the, on the part of the, the West. So, and the reason for that is, is just the, you know, industry has gotten really good um, with these attacks. We've, we've grown a whole ecosystem um, around cybersecurity um, here in the West. Um, the government, from depending upon your perspective, may or may not have gotten good, um, you know, in uh, reacting to these threats. I can tell you, I know that we've, got, we've gotten better um, in being able to address these th threats and bring a, a whole of government approach, um, law enforcement, national security authorities, um, and the like. And so that's what you're seeing. And so an actor, um, a cybersecurity, you know, hacker, is going to use the least path of resistance, right? Um, and so the least path of resistance um, traditionally has been a spearfish and where a, an adversary can leverage a spearfish um, and not use a tools like a zero day that might cost uh, a million, uh, you know, a million dollars on the market, that's what they're going to do. And so in the West, we've seen a growing sophistication in the attacks, and we're going to have to evolve to address that threat. Um, when we're talking about the developing world, um, you know, a, a, a focus on the fundamentals of cyber, we can get into to more of what that looks like. Um, that's what's going to get them uh, good cybersecurity, um, you know, multi-factor authentication. We can, we can talk a little bit more about these things, but um, that's what's really happening. And you know, the other part is the West has spent a lot of money on this. So I think, uh, you know, I was listening to the, the Bank of America CEO uh, using CNBC just about a month ago. I mean, they spend billions and billions of dollars um, on cybersecurity. The staff is huge, right? So that's part of it too. So before I ask Cynthia to opine on how MITRE and the use, the role of governments in this, uh, Amit, is there a is there a distinction between like private or criminal cybercrime and government sponsored cybercrime or is it is it blending in your opinion sure i mean the trend uh by and large is a blending of the threat so what we associated uh before with nation state actors the use of zero days um the use of some more sophisticated techniques when it comes to to hacking like the supply chain attacks you know we're now seeing criminals uh being able to leverage that uh that's again because they the criminals have sprung up a whole ecosystem around being able to do these attacks where, um, you know, a lot of it's plug and play, it's available on the on the dark web. And so really, it's been a, a blending of the threat. A, a really good example of this um, is also on the nation state side, we, we see them, you know, leveraging criminal tools. And that's with the, the, the DPRK, right? So you see WannaCry as an example, that's leveraging ransomware for currency generation on the part of a nation. Um, not pet yet another example um, as well, right? So we're really seeing a blending of the threat with nation state actors using criminal tools, criminal actors using nation state level tools. Thank you. So, so Cynthia, where, where do you, I mean, where do you sit on this? There are a lot of disadvantaged uh, populations in terms of digital literacy, digital access around the world, especially in you know, in some regions, but even in the US and Europe, we have pop, we have uh, you know populations who are who are not able to participate and uh, are particularly vulnerable. Where 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 do you, uh, where does MITRE come in here? Uh, thanks. Um, so MITRE has not traditionally worked with, uh, with foreign governments directly. Uh, this is something that we're just starting to get into with a new uh, nonprofit association. Um, a nonprofit, is, uh, MITRE is a federally funded nonprofit that works in, in, these, uh, in these technology spaces. So we have recently started to work in Africa and Asia specifically on uh, looking at mobile uh, digital financial services and disproportionate access to those services. 
and how we can uh, improve that access and make it more secure for uh, particularly women, but also other disenfranchised groups in those two, in those two regions. And we found, to, to talk a little bit to um, Anna and Amit's part, uh, points about um, how things have exploded and changed in the last little bit, we find that governments have responded um, in a very mixed way. You know, some governments have responded really positively to the explosion of mobile digital financial services um, and to just the explosion of online transactions in general, especially through the COVID-19 mess. <laughs> um, but others have really reacted uh, negatively, have really tried to, ha have felt like that was taking control of monetary policy and economic policy and control of their currency out of their hands and have been reacting with um, <clears throat> kind of punitive policies, taxation policies, uh, internet shutdowns, restrictions on social media, some of which carry mobile, mobile wallets and mobile applications. So it's been interesting um, uh, and not always in a good way to see how governments have, re have reacted. Um, but the ones who've done well have done really well. They've really consciously thought through how empowering this can be to have these mobile digital financial services at people's fingertips, how they can really uh, increase um, access for the unbanked to financial services that they need to start businesses and pay bills and do utilities and do things like that. Uh, and they've laid really excellent regulatory frameworks, really um, invested in public-private partnerships to make sure that uh, that, that happens and is successful. So it's um, you know it's it's a little bit of a mixed of a mixed bag. Cynthia, when we talked, uh, you you indicated there were some challenges with fundamentals such as identity in many populations. The people just not having any form of digital or, or paper identity that could be converted into a digital identity even. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, that is one of the interesting linkages that we've found in trying to figure out <clears throat> how to improve um, how to improve access, and we find that that particularly affects uh, affects women in a lot of countries. Either um, either because they have more difficulty traveling uh, to wherever the single place is that you can get a government identity issued, or because they don't have um, the background, the underlying background documents or because um, it's expensive and they are less likely to have, uh, to have money to do that. There's a whole host of barriers. Um, and in fact, one of the most fundamental is a difference in education. Uh, in a lot of places in the continent we're less likely to have digitally literate or literate at all um, women and girls than men and boys in those, in those countries. Um, and so even when they do get digital identities and they do get access to these mobile digital financial services, they aren't always necessarily in control of those finances in the way that we um, would hope or, or expect. Um, they don't necessarily know if the cash in cash out agent is, um, you know, skimming a little bit off the top with every transaction or, um, or if they're encountering other kinds of um, fraud because they're just not... Uh, they just haven't received that education and training. So we would like to see more of that, more access to identity programs, but also more digital literacy training, even just a short awareness course associated with that. It's a little worrying that we're pushing for this digital financial services world, and yet we're still fighting literacy and numeracy. You know, it's a, a foundation that would perhaps misunderstand that it doesn't exist in many places. Um, Anup, can I pivot to you? And thank you for being patient. I know you, you, and you have been quite active in policy and and trying to build solutions within the region. Um, you know, how is the region? How how are how are these countries trying to help themselves? Have you noticed any like movements in terms of regulation or education? Thank you so much. Let me just talk. I mean, just to add to what Anna was mentioning about um, how the COVID triggered uh, digitization is, in fact, exposing many more pe people to uh, the risks of cybersecurity and so on and so forth. So we are also seeing that, you know, it's uh, uh, the digitization is impacting the organizations as well, because most more organizations are moving to uh, manage services because they have limited resources. And these third party uh, links, uh, the third party vendors and vulnerable systems are uh, causing to become the weak links, forming a primary access compromise point that need to be checked 
thoroughly. So we are seeing quite significant uh, impact in terms of uh, uh, mal malware attacks that are happening. Uh, and then uh, there is much more of cybersecurity related issues that have, uh, that have come to the fore. Uh, especially important to mention is that because of the digitization, the, the need for digitization, several million of people are using digital financial services for the first time. And they are naive when they have issues around awareness. And when it happens, uh, there are some con men who are very, very sophisticated in the sense that they come up with social engineering tactics, uh, which basically says that, uh, you know, if you uh, send this much money, you'll be eligible for a particular lottery or loan or whatsoever. So we are seeing increase in social engineering attacks. We are also seeing that digital microcredit, which has been in the rise, especially in Kenya from where I'm speaking today. Uh, we have seen those applications have also reported an increase in fraud in recent months. And this is especially uh, very risky for people who are using it for the first time. Uh, there's a particular aspect uh, that has been found very common in Kenya these days, which is around identity theft. So connivance of SIM operators and uh, I mean the, the operators on the ground uh, together with uh, the applications and the lure of easy money, it's leading to uh, these kind of very sophisticated, uh, uh, you know, frauds that are happening on the ground. Uh, governments, on the other hand, are uh, putting up some some good measures, so to say. So uh, governments have come up with digital privacy laws in most of the countries. Now we are seeing digital privacy laws. Uh, similarly, there is uh, much more focus on cybersecurity. So we have seen that. Uh, as part of the agenda 2063, the African Union, uh, there are quite a number of countries that have already signed and ratified and uh, some who have signed and are in the process of ratifying the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. So we are seeing that there is some more happening. And uh, a good thing also is that, you know, at, at the level of oneself, people are also becoming more aware about these kind of risks and they are taking some safeguard measures in place. And institutions are also gradually building up uh, their capacities as well as building up their infrastructure. So re-architecting some of the uh, IT systems so that you know the, uh, these kind of weak links could not be leveraged and, and exploited. It's, that's <clears throat> so. I, my head's just spinning on all those problems. Um, do you feel is it the criminals? Is it domestic crime or is it? international within the region are you finding you know you mentioned particular like nigerians scamming people but are they scamming other nigerians or is are criminals just attacking the whole digital financial services equally i mean if, if i may talk about uh, uh, the the scenario here in east africa especially around malware attacks most of them are locally developed or re-engineered malware Okay. And then the ease, I mean, Amit was talking about, you know, you could go to dark web and, and basically buy a very sophisticated system and uh, whether it is ATM malware and so on, uh, which comes complete with the, the very easy how to instructions. So using that, I mean, yeah, people, local people are also calling local people, not like, you know, it's something happening from outside the borders. Wow. Okay. I mean, I mean, does the uh, the evolution of data protection standards and law is it helping the global law enforcement community uh, act and you know, prosecute on this cross border problem, or is is that still a challenge that the crime can occur in one country yet the, the victims can be anywhere? Um, it's still very much uh, a challenge. The FBI has thirty four international offices uh, around the globe. Obviously, uh, with some of the, uh, the other Western countries, particularly we refer to them as like the, the five eyes in the UK, Australia, for example, we've got good relationships um, and an ability um, to get information uh, from, those, um, from those countries. Um, we have presence in other countries where uh, for one reason or another, you know, it's not so great um, in terms of being able to, to get uh, information back. And a lot of that, you know, some of that is, geopolitics, uh, some of that is uh, relationships. Um, uh, and, you know, in, uh, within the Department of Justice, there's uh, mutual legal assistance, uh, assistance treaties um, that we can leverage um, to be able to get information, say for a server uh, where we're seeing malicious activity come out of. But the process um, at the end of the day doesn't move at the speed of cyber. 
right? So the actors have become, as I was saying, more sophisticated. So gone are the days of sitting on a, a piece of infrastructure for an extended period of time. They know what our laws are um, and they're able to, to cycle the infrastructure uh, in such a way as well. So um, you really the, the, the hardest piece now, I would say, when it comes to, to cyber and investigations is really who's behind the keyboard. And that is only going to get uh, more difficult. Is the, is the um, is our, should our behavior be more defense then? Or, I mean, how do we balance defense and prosecution? You know, there's this old adage in the cybersecurity industry that, you know, we have to be right every time and the criminal only has to be right once. So it's a little exhausting. Um, but yeah, do we so, focus on defense or focus on better law enforcement ability to act? So a good day for us, right, is bad guys in handcuffs, right? Uh, yeah. In cyber, <laughs> um, it's a little bit more difficult, particularly, you know, on the nation state side. Um, so the focus should be on defense. And as you said, defense is a very tough thing to do. Um, but, you know, the focus should be uh, on uh, defense. Uh, what I would say um, on the other end of it is uh, particularly, so the, the Bureau is a little bit unique. So we're not a, just a pure law enforcement uh, organization. We also have counterintelligence, uh, national security authorities as well. And that's where I think, um, you know, the, the United States government in particular um, should be looking to kind of leverage um, all of that um, as it relates to, to cyber. Uh, because as you noted, um, you know, we've done a lot of, you know, what we, what's referred to as name and shame indictments. Um, I think those have been good um, over the last five years in actually outlining the activity for the public um, to, to have awareness around what is going on and how uh, nations as well as criminal actors are, are leveraging cyber. But going forward, um, you know, we, we, you get to a point of diminishing return. So a focus on defense and a focus on leveraging kind of all the authorities. Um, and we talked about this, I think, in the previous panel, some other uh, people on this panel have mentioned it too, but really that bottom up um, digital literacy is going to be very important. I know the, uh, the Netherlands, um, they've got a great program where um, they uh, look for, or, or when they identify at-risk youth that are leveraging um, cyber, um, they try to get in front of them, work with them to become, you know, go from black hat hackers to white hat hackers to help out uh, the government. So we need more of those types of programs here in the West as well. Oh, thank you. Um, before we move on, um, just to the audience, please remember to submit questions if you have anything you want us to dig in on as, as we go forward. Um, but I wanted to follow up with what Annette was saying and ask Cynthia if there are particular groups that that we should be focusing on, particularly vulnerable groups, that we actually have a, a possibility that we could be more successful with. You know, um, you know it's, uh, we often talk about you know, large companies and we want to protect you know, the Walmarts and the city banks of the world, but they are very sophisticated. They have a lot of money and they make a lot of good decisions. But who are, who are the groups where if we just gave them the right information or the right assistance, they could materially be less at risk from criminals? So I, I think there's two answers to that. Um, I think the first one is the one that we've kind of all touched on, which is that just by extending a certain amount of digital awareness, we could help a lot of people to take very basic steps to protect themselves and, and, their, and their, their phones and things. Um, at, at sort of the other end of that spectrum, um, I think we in the West are used to um, to relying on our 20, 30 years of experience in this area, to our tons of resources, uh, our pretty extensive workforce. Um, and in a lot of Africa and Asia, those, those conditions just don't pertain. You know, we're, we're very focused on, and every country that we work with is very focused on protecting critical infrastructure uh, from, from these increasingly sophisticated attacks. But in a lot of those areas, they're running Microsoft XP on critical infrastructure, or they're, you know, they're running bootleg software on government systems. These are, these are systems that they couldn't secure if they wanted to. They're not securable at, as they exist. And the resources are not there to, to bring them up to that level where they could, um, where they could start implementing good patching programs and things like that. So it's a really, um, 
thorny problem in a lot of those in a lot of those areas. And we're we're trying to work with governments um, to really focus on the basics, to really start on with fundamentals like knowing what's connected to your network and uh, that asset management and really controlling um, access at the you know, administrator account access, things like that. Very fundamental things while trying to bring their systems up to the point where they can secure them. There's a lot of foundations to be laid before we can make a lot of progress in the big spaces. Just to, does, oh, please, yes, I mean, go ahead. I think just to highlight uh, what Cynthia was saying, and I'm not picking on uh, a particular country, but if you look at um, the Bank of Bangladesh hack, which happened, I guess it was around 2016, uh, 2017 timeframe, right? So you have the Bank of Bangladesh, they're instituting uh, the SWIFT system, which is uh, you know an international um, system used for financial transactions. And the way that it was implemented, right, is they have a router that you could go buy, um, you know, from a Best Buy that is now on a flat network um, that combines both their, you know, their their internal network along with their their Swift network, and the actors are almost able to get away with a lot of money, right? Had it not been for a typo um, on their on their part, right? So that kind of highlights what what Cynthia um, kind of mentioned there. No, I remember the hack intimately. Um, yeah, sim simple things. Um, and uh, you know, without dwelling too much on it, I, I think we often forget that the criminals have done a masterful job at, at espionage and information collecting. Um, certainly in the MasterCard world, we know that any misconfiguration is very quickly found by criminals. They scan for them and they know how to act immediately when they find them. Um, they're just waiting to, to jump. So the basics are always the most important. Um, uh, Anna, uh, how, how did Cynthia's viewpoint resonate with you? You know, as on the ground, is are you seeing the same thing? Oh, yeah, I completely agree with uh, uh, with Cynthia. Um, the so critical infrastructure, and we've just seen it um, two weeks ago in South Africa, where one of our transnet, um, our port authority, and and sort of transport. Um, well, National Transport Agency, I, I think that's what we would call them, um, suffered a ransomware attack. And um, what that showed is, A, it really, um, you know, cybercrime can have like a, a strategic um, sort of impact on the companies, on, sorry, on the on the countries, um, you know, like overall economy. And, and it can put things like South Africa, which is still seen as the gateway into Africa, that's been challenged now, you know, if investors see, geez, we can't use your ports for a whole week. Um, let's rather go uh, somewhere else, you know? So it really, I think, woke everybody up here to say, well, this is serious and including the government, which is a good thing, you know? Um, but what that showed is that when, when things like that happen is that the industry, the security industry, we very closely knit across South Africa and, and even beyond um, beyond that. So people help each other out in cases like that. Um, but the, the the government response was quite um, sort of, uh, in, they, they, they operate in different silos and are not necessarily aligned enough. And what needs to happen is that we, a, we don't have enough good people, resources. That's the first problem which we have to obviously address. But even the good people that we do have, they're not necessarily working with each other because they're, com they're in competing departments. There's no communication. So what this, I think, incident has showed us is, and this is what Cynthia also said, is um, we really have to put more emphasis in sort of public-private collabor collaboration and helping the governments in addressing the basics, first of all, and then coming up with, I feel, is the most important thing, is to come up with a national cybersecurity incident response or CSERD, uh, maybe not just national, but but Africa-wide, uh, that can assist, or possibly even global, that can assist in cases like that, because we will see more of that. And it's not necessarily that the cyber criminals um, Yes, there are some of them that are local. And in this case, you know, I, I, you know, um, I don't think they were local at all. Um, but the 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 let's call them the bad guys. I don't want to, you know, discriminate any any nation. But they know that Biden or the the US have uh, declared ransomware national threats. Um, 
Whereas, you know, I'd, I'd rather go into a country where I know that the government is a lacks the, the regulation, it lacks the enforcement. Um, so I'd rather go there where I know that we do have a, quite a large uh, proportion of our economy that is cyber dependent, quite heavily so, and that may very well pay. So I, I think we will see much more of that on the continent, um, interest from, um, you know, international cyber gangs, um, cyber crime gangs that uh, will attempt to attack our critical infrastructure. And then obviously, Cynthia mentioned the, the sort of um, the global awareness on the consumer side, absolutely. And I actually believe, and this is something I always say when we speak to like the press here locally, is that being cyber savvy or cyber aware is no longer a tech skill, it's a life skill. And the government, again, should start with that education on the lowest level. And, I'm, and it's actually not just cyber awareness, it's sort of critical thinking because misinformation and all of that, I, I, I consider that as part of it. So critical thinking, um, sort of online safety, digital literacy, just standard literacy, obviously that would be the first good step to have that, but where we have schools that should be incorporated in the curriculum. I love that. Oops. Not a text Go ahead, skill, Cynthia. it's a life skill. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to start no, using that. <laughs> yeah. No, I was going to say, I mean, small children learn at a very early age, lock the door when you leave the house. Yet they don't exactly. learn lock your computer or, um, you know, I, I used to do a lot of presentations to public and one of my, you know, I used to say, you, know, you don't have a rich uncle and uh, don't click here to see puppies. You know, it's two, <laughs> two live, basic life skills that will save you so much pain. Uh, exactly. And the third, third is don't put anything, anything on the internet that your grandmother would disapprove of. Um, yeah. Um, Amit, if we, are we forcing the criminals into certain geographies where, is it, is it good that they're in place in a small number of places that we can't get to them? Or would you rather they were scattered around? Um, I mean, I don't think that we're necessarily doing anything um, to push them in, in one, um, you know, kind of region or another. This is um, a field of, of opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the attack surfaces are so large. Um, and, you know, some of it comes down to, to economics as well, right? So I think, uh, I think someone had mentioned Nigeria um, uh, before early on in the talk. So you know, we get about 800,000 complaints through IC3, which is our, our outward facing website, where we take cyber crimes uh, complaints uh, from the public. 70% uh, of those are social engineering uh, around business email compromise, uh, as well as uh, romance scams, which are still very popular as well. Um, and a lot of that, um, you know, uh, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but I know just, you know, in talking to some of the folks that I work with here, a lot of that is also um, emanating in Nigeria, and that's strictly kind of uh, economics as well, right? So these are people that um, the barrier to entry on cyber is low too. So to the extent that we can, you know, create a higher barrier to entry, and a lot of that is going to be what we talked about here. Um, that's what's really going to kind of clamp down and force uh, people to kind of uh, move on from using this as a as a vector, right? But right now the barrier to entry is low. Um, there's a whole ecosystem around it, as we as we discussed. Um, so it's not any 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 one particular region. Okay. Uh, and up, we have haven't managed to get to you for a while. Do you think companies are doing enough, or are they doing the right things? Are they spending their time wisely on to solve this problem? Uh, yes, I mean we are seeing some of the companies are now uh, coming up with digital and financial literacy program because they want to actively make um, the customers aware about the malicious messages, the phishing attacks, the spoofing. Then also, why is it important to mask uh, the PIN and password? Uh, coming back to your previous question, you were asking uh, who is the most vulnerable in all of this. I think people who are below $5 uh, or households that are below $10 a month kind of category are most vulnerable in the sense that uh, if they conduct one transaction, it goes wrong or there is a fraud or something that happens, they will never be able to trust digital financial services. And there are about 1.1 billion people who are oral in nature. These are illiterate or neo-literate people who can count money, uh, physical money can do their transactions, but when it comes to digital money, they are not as aware. And I think for them, it is, uh, uh, it's, it's, it, the financial resources are so constrained that they, if, if one uh, transaction goes wrong, they will not be able to trust the system. 
so i think the financial uh, financial institutions and the people and the actors who are in part of this they need to uh, train them and provide some kind of awareness and literacy around how to utilize the digital financial services uh, we have seen some uh, recent attacks happening like in uganda in october 2020 Uh, in the country's mobile money network, there was uh, some attack where hackers used two thousand mobile SIM cards to gain access to mobile money payment system, and they were able to, uh, you know, defraud the system by about four to five million dollars. So, I mean, institutions need to also step up their infrastructure as uh, the number of transactions that are increasing very very rapidly. We have we are seeing quite significant increase happening. in number of transactions even the gsma's report talked about 2 billion transactions happening a day uh, it used to be 1.7 billion transaction last year so anup i mean in some countries like i pick on the uk for example where the uh, the individual has almost no liability for the losses of scams you know regulation and government force the banks to compensate people even when they are ridiculously lapse with cyber security is is that true is that generally true or is the is the individual the victim of the scam usually the one who has all the liability for the scam in most developing nations unfortunately it's the victim who is who is liable and he okay. you know, he is uh, i mean has to bear the brunt of the loss Right. Okay. And what if, what if the loss is systemic? Yeah. You know, what if the bank loses all their money? Is it still there's no compensation for the individuals? Or in most cases, no. It is not uh, the compensation is not given. At times, you know, banks would would not want to shame themselves by getting the whole uh, thing get uh, getting publicized. So in that case, they would like to compensate out of pocket and do a settlement on the side. But systemically, there is no provision or procedure or policy. to compensate the individuals uh, and then there there is a maze of paperwork that one has to jump through in fact i mean i was once in uh, once uh, my card was cloned and i was traveling from one place to another place i was on the flight by the time i landed i got to know that you know already about 4000 dollars is what i lost and the transactions were happening everywhere it was in uh, one was happening in japan another one in chicago and so on so forth and it was happening in such rapid succession So I, I hope that wasn't to... a Mastercard. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was not Mastercard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so I mean, uh, fortunately, I knew people from the bank, and I said that you know the the worst thing that I could do here is just put it on LinkedIn and Facebook and let everyone yeah. know. And my money was refunded. So it was a settlement that was done. Later on, I got to know that the card company paid them because they were able to verify and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. but that's an ex- that's a very first world experience and you're saying that's not the general experience of the people that's not the general experience no um, i had to call I, the ceo of the bank by the way sorry to jump in here but like Please. Said, it's a uh, it's different like if you uh, it's very similar to um you know what anup said if you happen to do if you happen to be a victim of uh, call it business email compromise or what they call app authorized authorized payment fraud where you at the end of the day authorize the payment so there's nothing you know the bank just says sorry but you did this or you gave your your pin of a some sort of bishing or social engineering attack but if you happen to have your card cloned or you have an and I had that happen to me multiple times um they're very good and you always get your money back and in fact you know like credit card i think it it might be a credit card company so Yay, Mastercard, Visa, etc. Uh, that they are the ones who actually pay back. Um, but I had um, only good experience locally with credit card fraud. However, any other type of fraud, you be on your own. Yeah, so credit cards are maybe a little unique because we we have a lot of rules. All the networks have the same rules about recovery and KYC, etc. But these new novel payment methods, and I'm thinking of. Like let's think about AfriCrypt, for instance. You know, two twenty-year-old brothers have sconed with three point six billion dollars of of money that uh, I think Anup would say that these this is money people could ill afford to lose. Um, completely unregulated. Um, uh, maybe we should we could ask Cynthia like how how do you do you feel governments need to do more to regulate these new novel financial systems and to provide safety nets for the population or or is it buyer beware if you want to gamble with cryptocurrencies you're on your own 
I, I absolutely think that governments need to do more to regulate the space. And I think there are examples out there on how that can be done. Mm -hmm. um, GSMA has their framework for mobile money certification. Um, governments can start there. Uh, M-Pesa, you know, certainly complies with, um, with those, uh, with that framework. Um, I, I think it's, Governments, um, you know, some are a little more functional than others. Um, maybe that's not the word, but uh, <laughs> they, maybe they're they fighting varying, different fights. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, they have varying abilities to to do yeah. some of these things, and regulation can be um, one of the, one of the issues that came up earlier with a meet was authorities, and governments have uh, many governments have a difficulty separating and defining um, roles and responsibilities between law enforcement and regulatory authorities and policymaking authorities. Um, and when those things are not clearly defined, it's hard to do things like regulatory policy. Um, but, there are, but there are some best practices. Having some kind of a, um, of a you know, active government support for establishing standards for um, for leveraging the liability on the provider and not the customer, um, making sure that there are not, uh, you know, any kind of predatory fees or mm -hmm. clauses, things like that. Having a customer support that people can actually access and that actually helps them, uh, all those things are are important. And and the and having government ensure those ensure those losses. Those are all things that governments can do and should do in their own best interest. This is. Mobile money has the potential to really uh, invigorate economies, um, and governments are short-sighted if they don't provide, if they don't help make that a safe ecosystem for people to participate in and for um, outside investors to uh, to leverage. Um, it, it, it can be a great boon, but only if people trust it. So I guess a question for everyone, I mean, how do you, Cynthia, I, I agree with everything you just said, but you're you're describing a an inherently boring experience, like regulated, <laughs> enforced, um, but has the amazing repercussions of, of lack of liability or clear liability, the ability to recover your money if it goes wrong. It has a whole bunch of benefits that we perhaps understand and value as experienced digital financial users. But if you talk to one of Anna's typical 19-year-old digital first, you know, di new digital, and you say, hey, there's this really cool Afro -crypt cryptocurrency card, or you could go and apply to a bank to get a credit card and, and a bank account. How do you, how do you persuade people that the, the, I don't want to say the traditional financial systems, but the regulated controlled financial systems are inherently less risky than the exciting novel new digital payment methods? Well, I think, first of all, you have to actually make them more trustworthy. I think a lot of the banks mm -hmm. in a lot of these parts of the world are not themselves mm -hmm. Uh, well-regulated or, or trustworthy than the national banks by and large are, but a lot of regional okay. banks and small banks and SACOs and things like that aren't. Um, and I think, you know, talking about credit cards for a lot of this uh, part of the world is, you know, they can't remotely qualify for a credit card and they're not going to be able to for some time. And that kind of gets us back to that identity thing, right? If there was a way yeah. to, you know, to gradually build your identity, build your build your credit, those are things that could help people get from where they are to, to that level. But, you know, at the moment, they're lucky if they can even, if they can even open an account. Um, and mobile money often is the only thing available to them. So if you don't have the identity or the access, like even physical mm -hmm. access to a bank, then mobile money is what you're going to fall back on. So finding a way to make that a safe experience is, I think, in everyone's interest. Yeah, and I think you're right. The, the traditional credit cards are the wrong solution, um, but also the un, completely unregulated micro lending is maybe the wrong solution. And finding that middle ground is is important important for everyone. Um, just last call for questions from the audience before we jump into closing closing statements. Um, I have a, I had a question for Amit, if I may, about the you said something earlier. We were talking about you know, the agents of foreign governments and. And I have a pet peeve of whether can you be a cyber criminal if you're working under the uh, orders of a, of a foreign government, or are you just lead doing your job? And I didn't know if you had a particular stance on that. I know the 
there's been some indictments made recently about for uh, against uh, some Chinese nationals working for the People's Republic Army of China. How, how do we rationalize that problem? Um, so I would say you can't have your cake and eat it too. Right? So, <laughs> so That's just, a good answer. You know, just like, look, this, this, is not, this is not a secret, right? Like we have a whole industry around this um, on the government side, contractors involved. Um, if the Bureau were to catch one of them, you know, moonlighting is the, the term um, as we refer to it, right? Um, they would, f- um, you know, f- face the, the full arm of, uh, of the law, right? Um, now, in other countries, I think you mentioned uh, China, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, it's kind of a wink and a nod, a look the other way, but, you know, to the extent that it becomes public and it uh, calls into question the image um, of that particular nation state, I can tell you that, um, you know, that particular nation state is going to be looking to, to cut ties with them, right? Um, so while it may work, uh, while it may be uh, lucrative for a period of time, um, it's not a, a sustainable model if you're kind of, trying, you know, double dipping is, you know, it's kind of what, you know, what the, these folks would be doing, right? So um, it's not a sustainable model anyway. And I, I, I have to imagine any government um, will look to cut ties um, with those folks, whether in some form or fashion. Is it, is it as simple as espionage is espionage versus attacks on civilian infrastructure is criminal or is it more subtle than that? Yeah, so on the espionage side, right? So some of the, you know, some of it is there's bounties that are put out. Um, and so these are actors that are looking to proactively get access to information that they feel that the government is going to want at some point in time. So that kind of stuff um, is sanctioned. Um, now, the issue becomes is when that kind of gets a little bit out of hand. So I think critical infrastructure uh, would be a line um, that would be drawn um, when it comes to, you know, what we refer to as contractors, right? So these are people that are not in uniforms, in government installations that are actually doing the hacking. So there is a line, but it's it's really a gray area. And fortunately, you know, we haven't had any real kind of catastrophic events where that's kind of gone south. Um, where people have gotten access to networks and done things that they shouldn't, where they weren't sanctioned to. Um, but, you know, these are also governments that have pretty good tabs on their folks and, uh, uh, you know, are, are making sure that to the extent that they can, right, that, uh, that things aren't going awry. Good. Okay. Well, we have 10 minutes left. That gives us a couple of minutes each. So um, let's talk about closing, uh, closing statements. I mean, what... Let's think about what we can leave the audience with to help them understand this space. And, and Anna, we started with you, so let, let's give you the opportunity first to tell us. Thanks, Aman. So I think one of the things that um, came up here is, you know, the sort of the different areas, um, to, starting at the bottom, like the sort of the end user or the the consumer level awareness, and then government. And I believe if you if you think about the scramble that all of these um, even telcos and established financial institutions like the banks, they're all scrambling to be first to market, competing with these fintech new market entrants. I mean, fintech is a, that's the sector in Africa that's receiving the most uh, equi- sort of um, investment. There's the most acquisitioning ha- acquisitions happening. So it is a really um, attractive um, sector, but with that and that sort of race to market, um, comes a responsibility as well to not just ignore the security side and the and the potential victims. So uh, again, and this is something I, I feel very strongly about, is the only way and, and beyond the financial services sector or, or sort of mobile payments, whatever it may be, beyond that, we as, as industry, and that I include the telcos in that because they also play in that even the retailers are now on the fintech bandwagon and, and offering mobile insurance, you know, so everyone is sort of in it. And um, so, so what I'm saying is that the, the industry, as well as the security industry, like the security players, as well as government, we, we need to work together and, and form more public-private initiatives where we can do things that um, have meaning and will make this a better place, you know, and help with the, the basics that we need to put in place. And they, we can't look at the government and expect them to do that by themselves. They lack the resources. Even us in the security industry on the continent, we don't have enough people. We've got 10,000 security professionals on the whole continent. I believe like Oracle has that many, you know, security pros working for them. So we need more people 
that join the security industry to help solve this problem. And in there lies an, a really nice opportunity. And I think that's something that we can um, maybe put out there to say, well, how can we uh, attract those 19 year olds, those youngsters that, um, that are keen to learn more, to join the cyber or the digital industry and, and sort of help the continent become a safer space and also give them a really attractive career path, um, not just for the continent, but globally. That will be my closing thought. Thank you. Thank you. And Amit, in the collaboration of public-private, I mean, how do we work better with you and your peers? Yeah, I mean, you know, I alluded to it early on. We have 56 franchises within the United States. We have 34 more um, internationally. So I would encourage people to have that relationship both locally um, as well as internationally, not only with the FBI, um, uh, also with your uh, local law enforcement, right? So they're the ones that are seeing the action on the ground. They're the ones that are there to, to help. Um, so just having that relationship, um, you know, just we've had great relationships um, and it's as simple as someone picking up the phone um, and calling us and saying, you know, they just want to talk, right? Absent of an incident. The, you you want to establish that relationship before something happens. Um, so that's the, the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you. Cynthia, any closing thoughts? I just found my mute button there. Uh, I think we've, we've um, all kind of been in, in, in very strong agreement that there's two aspects. There's the foundations, the technical foundations, of, and trying to make those better, um, you know, wherever they are. And, and then there's the governance and uh, public awareness piece, kind of the non-techie techie side. And I, it's, I think it's very important to work both of those two things at once. Uh, those policies and governance and public awareness are what enable technical uh, technical mitigations and, and risk management uh, activities to be successful, to be meaningful. Um, but in the end, it is a risk management game. Um, we're not going to be right every time. Uh, we're not going to eliminate every threat. Uh, governments um, in a lot of the world don't have the resources to make super meaningful strides all at once. Um, and so trying to figure out what, where the, where's the greatest bang for the buck, um, how to help them not try to do everything at once, but to prioritize and find those things that can be most impactful. And sometimes they are the simplest things. They are um, you know, the, the SysTop20, the, the basic training, growing your workforce, letting people know what isn't, isn't acceptable and why. Um, those, those things are, are simple and often they're not that expensive, um, but they're also not very sexy. Uh, and so trying to, um, trying to help people understand that that's the way to start and really make a big difference. I think it's, it's Thanks. Now, and you would, you would agree that even if you have a government which is distracted by other problems, you, there's still a lot of self-help uh, that can make a difference to your, your level oh, yeah. of protection. Absolutely. Good. And up, you want to close us out with your perspective on the region? Sure, thank you. So um, in my closing remark, I would just like to say that the COVID crisis has forced anything which can digitize to digitize and uh, hence has uh, kind of, you know, brought forward the susceptibility of digital financial services to cyber attacks and digital frauds. Uh, we have seen that it has become very much uh, prevalent in this period. Uh, so I think the providers need to focus on uh, proactive cust customer awareness campaign. They need to also start building up their cybersecurity capabilities as well as invest in infrastructure because the infrastructure requirement is certainly going to go up. Uh, similarly, on the government, gov government side, on the governance side, on policy and regulation side, there needs to be national strategies and policies that meet international standards around cybersecurity, data protection, uh, data privacy, etc. And uh, uh, lastly, I would want to close with saying that, you know, there can be and is a potential to coordinate with what is happening right now around and, and also uh, the cybersecurity efforts that can be made so as to align the limited resources and maximize its impact, especially in the wake of pandemic, because certainly we are seeing that there is, lim uh, there is limited resources when it comes to uh, human resources, as well as also the financial resources. So I'll stop at that. No. Thank you very much. You. And with that, let me hand back to Michael, our amazing MC. Um, let me thank everyone 
for attending. Thank you to all the panelists for participating. I think it's been very interesting and uh, no doubt we'll get extra feedback from uh, the participants in the future. Michael, over to you. Thank you, Simon. I, I want to thank you especially for, as you said, <laughs> wanting to be here, really. Um, thank you for making that extra effort and to collaborate among, as I mentioned today, we really do have a global group of panelists. Um, Anna is uh, out in South Africa. Anouk, you mentioned you're in Kenya now. You're always somewhere. Um, many, and Amit, um, great to see you again. And Cynthia, you made the effort to be here. Thank you so much. Many of you have helped us at the DFSO for quite a while in, in, in different areas. Um, I just wanted to mention Anna and Anoop also helped us with a uh, gender and cybersecurity and fraud um, investigation um, and research. And your work was really invaluable to us. Um, it was also great to meet Simon earlier with the MasterCard team. Um, Amit was at our summit, which we hope to go ahead and have again soon. I think we all um, would prefer in person if we can, and Zoom is an option. Um, so thank you, all of you. Thank you. Um, I will now transition to our blockchain group, and I wish all of you um, uh, goodbye for now, and we'll put you as an attendee and hope you join us for the next panel.